Hey, what's up everybody? Hey guys, thanks for joining our very second live stream. We're super excited. Um, we're going to kick things off by talking about the five lessons we've learned um, about budget sailing since we left the United States. But first we wanted to mention the most epic comment of the week and dedicate the Atticus Chug to No Job. This goes to you, No Job. No Job. Cheers, dude. And the comment was... <laughs> Jordan, you naughty, naughty boy. Mama's looking smoking hot, young man. Merry Christmas, you two. So thanks for making both of us crack up, No Job, and thanks for your positivity. Hey, there <laughs> so he is. So here's a chug to you. No Job. <laughs> you just missed it, possibly, but we just uh, we just uh, made the week's comment, best comment to you. So cheers, buddy. Cheers. <laughs> All right, so um, we're going to go ahead and hop into the five lessons that we've learned since we um, about sailing. Since we've left the United States, um, it's going to take us about five minutes, so we're just going to pound through them, and then we'll open up the forum for questions and discussions. Um, so feel free to say hello, but if we're not responding, it's not because we don't see you. Uh, it's Hey, Dave, it's because um, we're just going to get through all these topics real quick. So Jordan wanted to mention a quick note about a uh, caveat to this episode. <laughs> That's right. So, okay, so this this uh, these five lessons that we're going to be talking to you about, um, Might be no sound. Yeah, okay. Real quick, can ev everybody let us know if there's sound going on right now? Um, okay, so um, here's my introduction to what we're going to be talking about. Our five lessons that we've learned since we've been cruising. I really wanted to share these with you guys today because when we were preparing our boat, when we were preparing Atticus to start cruising and start sailing around the world, um, especially in Key West where we were in the boatyard, we didn't meet a lot of cruisers. Um, we met a lot of people that claimed they had cruised like 10, 20, 30 years ago, but we didn't meet a lot of active cruisers. And so we really were like thirsty for real life anecdotes and descriptions of what the cruising lifestyle is actually like, specifically what the challenges are like realistically. So what, what things are difficult on a day-to-day -day basis and what things are you actually just don't need to worry about. So we wanted to give you guys, uh, paint a picture of what we found to be the five lessons that, uh, the top five lessons that we've learned since we've started cruising. And it's nothing mind boggling, it's just our own personal experience. Yeah, don't be surprised <laughs> if it's a little bit obvious at times, but I think, you know, for us it would have been great if we had known, like, listen, these are the things that we would recommend you focus on. Okay, so for, before hopping in, I just wanted to welcome back No Job, Ice Pack, Dave, um, Street Truck and Titan, nice, and my mom. Welcome, everybody. And Roger and Jack Film, sorry. Okay, all right, so lesson number one um, that we learned was once your boat is seaworthy, just go. So uh, I'll let you kind of elaborate on that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, um, like, this is a really good point. We almost titled this rule just go <laughs> and then i was like well wait a minute you really should make sure your boat is seaworthy first but the point of this lesson is once your boat is seaworthy everything else getting the boat comfortable to live on getting it aesthetically looking nice you know all of those other finer details um i found that with us we were kind of shooting in the dark as to which projects we should focus on and which aspects of our life on the boat we should improve first um, whereas had we actually just left and gone cruising, um, maybe for like a short period of time, we would have had a much better idea on how to alloc allocate our time and resources most effectively because we would have had an actual real experience cruising. Um, so as, as long as your boat is seaworthy, you can come up with a billion reasons why not to leave. And in our opinion, you should just go. Now, the main thing, the main caveat with that is um, make sure that you either have a plan on returning to a place where you can get parts, supplies, and materials, um, or make sure that there's a place on your route early on in your cruising experience where you can get parts, supplies, materials. If you're gonna go out into the middle of the South Pacific on your very first trip, that's probably gonna be pretty difficult because you're gonna find it difficult to find supplies. We were lucky, we had Cancun, um, after the first two months cruising and we were able to get everything that we needed here more or less um, So as long as you're able to get those supplies and materials to affect the repairs and 
the inevitable things that you decide that you want to improve, then you should just go for it, in our opinion, as long as your boat is seaworthy. That's the one uh, the one most important thing. And I guess the issue, or the, the basic um, point we're trying to make is only you can decide your own comfort level. So like when before we started cruising, some people were saying you absolutely need a water maker, you absolutely need a hard dodger, you absolutely need hot water. Um, and it was hard for us to decide like what we should buy because we had no idea what it would be like when we were actually cruising. So um, just, you know, everyone has different comfort levels. So the only way to figure out what you need is to get out there and start doing it a little bit. And uh, we also realized that, you know, when we were in cruising through uh, Cuba and a lot of the anchorages that we've been in, there were this little teeny boat putzing along. And even though we don't have much on our boat and our, our comfort level, uh, we're very minimalist. Um, we'd be right next to this huge super yacht, and they'd have the water maker, they'd have the air conditioning, they'd have everything. But we we're both seeing the same place, so and almost having the same experience if you just take out those luxuries. So yeah, just in our opinion, go for it. Just go for it. Um, real quick, want to give a shout out. Hey Ashley, how's it going? Woo. Happy to have you, Chris. The Corsair, and yes, we do remember meeting you in Marina Hemingway. I'd love to catch up with you and see how the, everything's been going since then. And hello to everybody else. We're going to keep moving on, and then we will address some of the comments. So what's number two, right. Desiree? Number two is optimize for comfort while sailing, not just at anchor. Yeah. So that's, a, that's actually probably my favorite lesson on this list. Um, when we were preparing Atticus, I focused a lot on, and so did Desiree, we, we focused a lot on making sure that Atticus was comfortable at anchor because we figured we'd be spending 90-95% of our time at anchor. Um, the problem with that is right now Atticus isn't the most comfortable boat underway in a lot of ways. Um, sun protection is one. We don't have a very good Bimini and, or Dodger. Uh, those are two things we're going to remedy before we leave Mexico, but the point being that we thought um, that we could just wear sun clothes, long sleeve shirts, big hats. Uh, but the fact is, is if you're hot in the sun, sweating, um, exposed to spray, if you're hot on the wind, that's going to make you in the back of your mind when you're sitting at anchor contemplating going to the next spot, that's going to make you kind of not want to leave. Um, th so the more comfortable you can make sailing on your boat, being underway, the more that you're going to just be happy to you know, pull up that anchor and head off to that new spot the moment that you hear about it. And that's going to make your cruising experience so much better. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of things that you can do to increase your comfort underway. Um, really good cockpit cushions is a good one. You know what I mean? The ability to kind of lounge while you're sailing. And again, protection from the elements is one of our and, biggest And I ones. would hop in and say, like, for sewing, for example, I had made all these, like, extravagant... Uh, cool contraptions inside the boat, um, but I didn't make any dry bags or any like cool little storage containers for our cockpit. So when we were uh, underway, it would get really messy and you know, it just wasn't optimized. So now that we've been sailing a lot, I have little ideas for different projects I want to do to make it more comfortable while you're out there. So, and that even includes like, you know, um, figuring out uh, what you want to use for keeping your drinks cold or drinking, keeping your drinks hot or how you want to handle your snacks. So lots of little things. Um, just, uh, and then I guess the best way to figure that out is to do a lot of shakedown cruises. So let's go into, um, there's lesson. so much more we could talk about that. We may do an episode just on that, but just the concept is an important one to remember. <laughs> cool. All right. So we're going to pop over to lesson three, which is, <laughs> which is, um, pack a picnic when you're exploring a new city. So we, when we were exploring Havana, we found it to be super expensive, um, so what we did is I would just pack um, a breakfast, lunch, and quasi-dinner in my book bag. Um, water, maybe a bottle of wine or rum. Maybe two bottles of wine. <laughs> yeah, or rum. And whatever. Rum. Yeah, whatever is cheap. Um, and then what we would do when we were exploring is we'd kind of find it as like a challenge to look for a cool place where we would enjoy our lunch. Um, and it and ended up being kind of a game. So rather than spending thirty dollars for lunch, we were spending like three dollars. So yeah. that helped a lot. Absolutely. And in a lot of ways, like Desiree was saying, it was a game. So it became an activity. Like, okay, where are we going to eat our food today? So instead of looking for a good restaurant, we were looking for 
a spot with a view, you know, or a nice courtyard with like a nice little um, uh, old stairway leading up to the courthouse or something. That way you can like, as you're walking, learning, exploring, you're kind of on a mission to find a spot to just post up and hang out. So you're saving money, but at the same time you're drinking wine, eating good food. So again, that same principle, I think cruising on a budget, the whole idea the parties talked a lot about it, you know, uh, champagne cruising on a beer budget. I mean, that's the idea, right, is you, you, you're trying on a budget to be out there uh, and doing the same things and experiencing the same things that people... So, um, the next uh, lesson, I just wanted to say, somebody was mentioning, um, make a list of items for anchor items, or I, I said something about lists, and I think that's a really good idea as well, and that doesn't have much to do about budget sailing, but... The idea of kind of getting yourself organized um, and making lists for like underway trips and then once you're at anchor and then once you're in a marina is really helpful. It takes the, the thinking out of it. Yeah. Okay. And sorry, I think we just got offline for a second. Sorry about that, guys, oh. but we are back. All right, cool. So let's go to lesson number four. Um, we found that having a dinghy and outboard that can get us on a plane with both of us. We, we have a little visitor. Sorry, he's licking my feet. <laughs> this Everyone. Is <laughs> this is Drogon, the, the our new boat dog, the marina dog. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Cutest little thing I've seen in a long time. Okay, all right, you're good, Drogon. Be free. Uh, okay, so lesson number four is um, we found that we've loved having a dinghy um, and motor that can plane with both of us and with like my sewing machine or with a ton of groceries. So that's been really invaluable because rather than having to be at an expensive marina, we've been able to be at an anchor and then just zip into town or alternatively, as far as adventuring and exploring, we've been able to be at anchor and then do a epic reef dive like seven miles out. Um, and we've run into a lot of cruisers who can't actually get on a plane and so they haven't been able to join us So that's been really awesome for us. Yeah, and in fact, I mean we we subscribe to the party philosophy in almost every way But one thing that I disagree with them on in you know, the modern cruising uh, Era is the fact that I think getting on a plane on your dinghy whether you're on a budget or not is so important but specifically if you are on a budget it's a little counterintuitive it costs more money to get a dinghy that can do that and an outboard along with it but if you can get on a plane um, you can uh, you know find the most protected anchorage so that you're gonna be safe for a while and then you can shoot around and entertain yourself every single day checking out the best dive sites spear fishing checking out villages that are 12 15 miles away so you it's, an, it's a, a way to entertain yourself for days or even weeks with just the cost of gasoline, which can be extremely minimal. And Ice Pack was asking what dinghy do we have? Uh, our, our dinghy is a um, Zodiac, and it's an inflatable with actually a folding transom, which scared me at first. So far, we're doing okay with that. That allows, because Atticus is so small, that allows us to store it on the cabin top because making sure that we didn't clutter the foredeck was really important for me for uh, see, you know just being safe at sea. Um, and then we've got a, a big eight horsepower Tahatsu four stroke to go with that. So it's a really big outboard for that dinghy, but it's holding up so far. Yeah, the outboard yeah. takes up like an eighth of our deck. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so lesson number five, last lesson that will open up for questions and chatting. Um, and uh, it's uh, having the ability to get and understand weather information is super important. Yes, okay, so this is specifically the one I thought might sound obvious, but I think that it, we didn't realize how liberating it would be. Um, we are, the way that we get uh, weather information while we're cruising and, and kind of outside of internet access is we have a, a single sideband receiver um, or a shortwave receiver, ch cheap little thing, $100 on Amazon, and then maybe $50 more in little cords and stuff that connect it to your uh, computer. And then you can get programs on your computer that actually take weather facts signals that NOAA puts out, and then you can get images from those weather facts signals. So you don't need an actual weather fax machine that costs like over a thousand dollars anymore 
you can just get a hundred dollar radio on Amazon, get a wire uh, antenna going up your mask, and I'd say 80% of the time I get a clear enough image where it's usable, um, which is awesome because they broadcast four times a day. So I mean, you can get an image and forecasts up to, I think it's three days in the future, 72 hour uh, forecasts um, every single day. And uh, the point, I, I'm sorry, I'm rambling because I love this topic, but, and we will do a video on this as well, but the once you have good, reliable, you know, three-day forecasts, and you can access those from anywhere, you know, whether you're in a, you know, deserted, uh, isolated little bay, or whether you're right next to a city, once that's not a problem for you anymore, you don't worry about being uh, disconnected. So you you can go out to that um, you know distant island that you really wanted to check out, even though you're not certain what the weather is going to look like in seven days or two weeks, because you're going to be able to keep up with the weather while you're there. And so you can stay there as long as you want, as long as it looks like the weather is holding up. Um, whereas back in the day with the parties, you know, the longer you stayed in those isolated areas, the longer you had no idea what kind of systems were brewing up around you. So um, being able to access weather information no matter where you are, on a budget there are options, um, is a huge relief and uh, a big lesson that we've learned. And something that we haven't done, but um, we both think it'd be a good idea, is um, kind of probably be, it would have been better if we had done this before we left but training someone in our in our family or in our, one of our really good friends to read weather as well as we do um, because we do have the Delorme um, satellite um, phone radio uh, text communicator I device. guess you could say. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so you know it would be nice we think to have that as a backup as well um, so that's something to think about, which uh, we'll try and we'll let you know how it works out. Mm -hmm. um, so real quick, somebody mentioned, yeah. Eating, Wait, is that it for the lessons? Uh, that's it for the lessons, but I do want to address some of the comments that people have been having uh, in regards to the lessons. So, um, Chris, first of all, say hello to your brother, Desiree. Okay, hello, Tommy. <laughs> all right, so Chris Perkins was saying um, uh, there are a lot of really good um, markets in Italy, and that's also. Uh, a huge way that we've learned to save money, uh, especially in Mexico, um, if you find a local working in tourism or a taxi driver, anything like that, if you ask them where they eat lunch, oftentimes they'll take you to a delicious local spot, um, and we found that that is really a good way to save money. We did that in Mex uh, in Cuba as well. There was like some pizza at one tourist place for like $13 a pizza and then we went around the corner went to a little local spot and we were yeah. having a whole pizza for like five cents. It was crazy. <laughs> and, that and, that, and that goes, to, uh, one point I'd like to make on that is that another game that we played while we were trying to, you know, save money while checking out cities is uh, figure out how much it costs you to make a meal you know, via going to the grocery store and cooking for yourself, figure out what that base cost is per meal. And while you're walking around the city, if you can find a meal for less than that, then go for it because you're saving money. Um, and as long as you've come up with that figure in your head, uh, you're able to, you know, kind of do that math real quick. And that allows you to, you know, experience some really fun street food opportunities and even restaurants, depending on what part of the world you're in. Mm -hmm. Real quick, somebody was asking, um, what our monthly budget? Sorry, you can keep mm -hmm. looking. Our monthly budget. We we talked about this in our last live stream, so I won't go into it too much. But so far, on average, we've been spending about twelve hundred dollars a month, um, and that's not including like um, you know thinking about our annual maintenance and trying to dis you know distribute that to a monthly budget. That's just um, actually what we have needed month to month, twelve hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Um, and we'll probably do an episode specifically about that too. And then Dave said, "I got, I saw, I saw a guy that made a makeshift bimini by using a heavy-duty uh, table parasol, <laughs> like a drink-sponsored one from a bar. Looked a bit weird, but it worked. <laughs> That's yeah. a good idea, actually. <laughs> I've heard of that. Yeah, I've heard of that. Big umbrellas. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Any other? Do you guys have any other questions about our five lessons learned? Yeah. Yeah, bring them on, and uh, until you uh, until we get some, I'll just ramble. Mm -hmm. I guess <laughs> <laughs> sounds good. How, how does a single guy, forty nine, get a beautiful woman to want the boat life with me? <laughs> I don't want to do super yachts. 
and and du- and dust to find her. We'll, we'll good have question. To, uh, yeah, we'll have to. We'll, well have to the think answer, about that. The answer is that Jordan tricked me into this. He he said, "Let's sail off into the sunset. Fixing our boat will take what two months." I think perhaps? I said two months. So uh, that 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 is how I did it. Just uh, lie. Mm-hmm. Just tell, tell her that. Be really charming and lie. Tell her that it'll only take two months. Now I didn't lie. I was just okay, stupid. Yeah, right, so right, right. that's the goal: is just be stupid, <laughs> and then you'll all your dreams will come true. <laughs> Oops, um, sorry. In fact, sometimes I actually wonder if that's almost like a, a small element of like what it takes to start cruising successfully is just put up with all the punishment and be too stupid to stop stop doing it. Uh, Another question. Do you have uh, and know how to use a sextant if you lose all of your electronics? Great question. Good question. We do have a sextant. Um, I have practiced with it a little bit, so I'm not going to tell you that I'm good at it. Um, we do have um, b- a bow ditch on board. Um, number nine, and that has a lot of the reduction tables on it. So as far as I understand, we'd be able to, in an emergency, use the sextant and Bowditch to uh, to make our way back to land. Now we haven't been in a situation yet where we couldn't just dead reckon our way back to somewhere. You know, everywhere that we've been so far, you know, as long as we could just make it back to a coastline, we'd be able to follow that coast to the nearest port. Um, but once we do our Pacific crossing, that will be a totally different story. And in fact, uh, I'd I'd go as far as to say it would probably be a good thing for us to get better at by the time we go from Cuba to Panama, because that's going to be kind of cutting through the middle of the Caribbean and, you know, that that would be a little bit harder to dead reckon our way back into Next question by Rob S. Most important piece of offshore safety equipment on boat? Oh, can I answer that? Yeah. I mean, tethers I and our that. and our jack lines easily. Yeah. Um, because, and like, I this shouldn't be an epiphany to anybody that's cruised much in the past, but for us, before we started cruising, I didn't understand how important jack lines and tethers were going to be because when you, I mean, when I'm trying to sleep and I hear and we're underway and I hear Desiree like walking forward to, you know, check on some of the gear or maybe reef the mainsail or something, I wouldn't be able to sleep if I didn't know for certain that she could not physically fall off the boat. Um, If if that was even a remote possibility, I wouldn't be able to sleep. And I know that's the same for Desiree. Yeah, and in fact, because I'm a little bit irrational, I know he's tethered in, but I, whenever I'm on, uh, whenever we're underway and it's nighttime, and there's a storm or something, I wake up every, like, five minutes, and I'm like, Jordan, Jordan. <laughs> and he's like, yes, I'm here. I'm mm-hmm. alive. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it's irrational, but it, it helps a lot. Eventually, I hope my brain just internalizes the fact that he's not going overboard. <laughs> yeah. So, no, that is that is by far and away the most important safety. Now, and uh, that said, I think um, it's not good to rely on the tether either because you can drown – um, you know, falling overboard and just being pulled in the water by your tether. So it's it's not exactly a good option to fall overboard, period. Um, so that's why whenever we take somebody, and we've talked about it a lot, like you have to assume that falling overboard means that you die, period. And once you just fully assume that, you start behaving differently. Like you, you, you think about your movements across the boat, you always hold on to something. Um, and so just having that sort of mentality uh, goes a long way too. So it's not a it's not a piece of safety gear, but I'd say that um, having that mindset is probably the biggest safety thing you can do on a boat. Mm-hmm. And uh, Dave Klaus uh, has a great question, which is which of you came up with the idea to buy a vessel and get started, and why? Um, I guess I'll answer that one. Okay. Um, Jordan had when I met Jordan, we were just friends. Um, we were working on a super yacht together, um, and he told me in confidence that he had always wanted to buy a sailboat and sail it around the world, if not around the world, at least for an extended trip. Um, and he read an article when he was 18 or so 
um, about two brothers. This is actually a bottle of wine from our wedding. <laughs> thank you. Um, Which our wedding photographer is here, Ashley. Yeah, we love thank you, you Ashley. <laughs> um, and so he read an article about two brothers who took a sabbatical from their lives and sailed offshore together and had a great time. So by the time, so when we met each other, Jordan. I kinda, believe that was the magazine Latitude 38. Yeah. Back out of from Santa, Santa Cruz. Cruz. Yeah. Well, it's not out of Santa Cruz, but that's it's from that region. Yeah. So Jordan told me about it in confidence, um, and we were just friends. Um, and I told him that that's awesome. Like you're probably gonna have a sweet little, like wife by your side or like girlfriend or hot thing, and you're gonna sail around the world and it's gonna be amazing. Um, little did I knew that that wife would be me later <laughs> um so we started dating and then i had i was working on super yachts because i wanted to save up enough money to do an around the world backpacking trip and buy an around the world flight um and jordan sort of convinced me that sailing around the world is like backpacking around the world except a lot more comfortable and Be and you can cook for yourself yeah, and, and you have your bed. Live in your own bed, sleep and in I your own bed. And I really like my bed, so... Yeah, <laughs> yeah I guess I, I, I just thought it would be a fun adventure, and I said, okay, let's do this. <laughs> um, little did I know it would take us three years to get started. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but I will say, if you guys are dreaming about this stuff, man, there is so much good literature on, like, cruising and the parties are one of my favorites and and they just inspired the heck out of me uh you know over years of dreaming about this stuff so i will really recommend them uh, so the uh, the corsair is asking what our work situation is like where we are um we talked about this a little bit in the last uh, live stream so we'll talk about just real quick so we've we've actually been uh f having as much work as we can handle we'll put it that way that's probably the easiest way to put it i'm in the middle of building an extension like a swim platform on a 58 foot Bertram um, and those old Bertrams just had like really high transoms so it was, it was and really high uh, uh, just uh, freeboard in general so it's almost impossible for you to get in and out of the water on those big boats and uh, so me and our neighbor who I've been working with non-stop since we moved here were hired to build a extension like a seven foot extension as a swim platform on that and that's been a long project we've been doing that for coming close to three months now i think so then mm -hmm. besides that i we built a bunch of rudders for people that ran into things in various parts of the caribbean so um if there's anything i've learned here it's when you're choosing a boat choose a boat that has a well protected rudder so e either a very substantial skeg or uh, ideally, in my opinion, transom hung. And the Corsair, um, we're actually going to release a video about how to find work while you're sailing. And one of the things that we found in Isla Mujeres is to be selective about who we work for. Um, so when we first got here, we were doing lots of little jobs for people that were taking like six hours, but we could only bill like an hour because for various reasons. Um, but what, what we both kind of ended up doing is finding people who have the money and want to pay for really good work. Um, and once you, you know, make it in with somebody who is willing to pay for, uh, high quality work, then they'll introduce you to their friends and then you'll have, um, more, uh, larger, you'll have more frequent larger jobs. So for example, I actually started sewing for the, uh, hotel owner that we work, that we live at. So okay, sorry. That didn't the make marina sense. owner where we sit, where we are right now, he owns a couple properties. Exactly, and so he, everyone needs uh, awning and canvas work. So um, I, I helped him out by just making a little TV cover once, and then he said, oh, we need five awnings, and then he said, oh, we need this huge curtain, and so that's really uh, grown. And I like taking jobs that are going to be big, that'll take me like three weeks, so that I can kind of settle into a schedule and make sure that they're. Um, not just high paying customers, but people who um, want high quality work. Um, Ice Pack asked, when did you get married? <laughs> and we got married November 11th. Um, and uh, on our Patreon page, we have a little sneak peek of our wedding photos. Um, but we'll also be releasing those to the public um, as soon as we get them edited and then fully ready to go. So you can take a look at our little sneak peek on our Patreon page. Yeah, but that was just very recently. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple things I wanted to talk about. Um, first of all, Serenity Sailor Girl asks, who came up with the name Atticus? 
uh, that was me. I had, you know, once I decided I want to start cruising, I pretty much decided I would name my boat Atticus. And I just love Atticus Finch from the novel To Kill a Mockingbird and, and the, the movie as well was uh, my favorite fictional character. And in fact, I'd say that uh, a fictional character that inspired me more than any other, um, besides maybe Luke Skywalker, I don't know. But, well, no, I take that back. Han Solo's cooler. But anyway, I'm sorry, I d digress digressing. So Atticus, I, uh, there's one scene from the movie in particular that I love, and Gregory Peck is you know, sitting outside of the jail when he knows that there's kind of a lynch mob brewing up. And I just loved how instead of, like, getting a gun and, like, you know, kind of spitting his tobacco like some cowboy might have done, like, he gets a lamp, a, a chair, and a book. <laughs> and, I, and I just love that. It's like, it's like through his own personal education, he's able to defend the defenseless. And I just think that's the coolest concept, is, like, educating yourself is is, you know, the, the most powerful thing that you can possibly do. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, that's how we came up with that. Also, um, Ashley Shutter is saying, Jordan, you knew Desiree would have to be that girl to sail with. Yes, I did know that. I <laughs> And I would not tell Desiree. I'm, you know, I'm kind of like, you know, I mm, kind of want to buy this sailboat. You know, it'd be kind of fun if, I don't know, maybe you want to come. But no, I had known for months... <laughs> months like i think we were friends for six months before we started dating and i had known for like five months and 20 like six days or something <laughs> like that you know when, we, when he introduced me to his mom uh, over skype and we again we weren't dating we were just friends um his mom told him later he's like i think you're gonna marry that girl <laughs> yeah. yeah she she called it yeah yeah <laughs> so uh rob s asked a really interesting question he says by the way i'm a cruiser too <clears throat> Um, any nervous encounters with shady humans while passage making? That's actually a really, really good question. We're curious to hear your answer as well. Um, but I would say um, the only shady encounter we had um, kind of made us decide to up our um, kind of like safety and security plan. Um, and we'll probably do a live stream about that. Um, in the future, but essentially what happened was we were in this very remote anchorage in Mexico. There's a big bay, uh, Bahia de Ascension, about 100 miles south of uh, where we are in East Mujeres. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of sailors out there, especially if you're on a small boat, um, you know, when we would shower, we would just hop into the ocean um, without clothes to get clean and you'd get like cool down <laughs> the, first of all there was absolutely nobody around us just this totally isolated secluded anchorage and we just realized that you know our swim trunks were never drying and they were starting to get kind of moldy so we're like all right if there's no one around we might as well just not wear anything yeah so anyways we were getting in the habit of jumping in the water and cooling down and like showering essentially in the ocean and um one time we were kind of venturing a little bit far off from our boat not even we were like 10 feet away from our boat actually um and out of nowhere comes this like um patrol boat full of i think like maybe four guys um and they were in uniform i believe um and they came up really close to us and jordan kind of went in front of me when they had like the the boat said policia so yeah. they were they were cops so they told us um you know, you shouldn't be swimming so far away from your boat. You have to stay close to your boat. And they were saying because there was crocodiles. Because there were crocodiles, which m maybe it was the case. I don't know. It was just kind of like shady and it gave us a weird feeling. Well, the weird part was how long they lingered for. Like, yeah. all right, there's crocodiles. Thank you for letting us know. We're only like 20 feet away from our boat, so it's really not very far. But the fact is that they just kind of lingered for a long time. And it was awkward, and I was, like, trying to swim in front of Desiree to, like, you know, keep them from seeing her. And and, I, and we I, just kind of, after the fact, we realized there's nothing we could have done. Like, mm -hmm. we're just so powerless in that situation. Um, and yeah. it, we, we suddenly realized, like, you know, we need to have a plan. Um, like, if you, if you do, you know, come upon that small fraction of society who actually, you know, is willing to do something... Um, you know, something that you wouldn't want to think about otherwise, like, what is your plan? And so we've started cultivating, like, strategies, and we've got, 
a lot of different kinds of pepper spray on board and different things. So we will talk about that in an episode coming up because it really is a it, it relieves a lot of stress and anxiety if you just have a plan. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was an it was a not very good experience. So I think we would have been a lot more comfortable if we had a plan B. But, mm-hmm. so but real, nothing happened. Real so. quick, ZZZ, I love that comment, says the only shady guy she found, she married him. <laughs> <Awesome>. <laughs> I love it. So You're totally right. So Fernando Brandao says, did you have any sailing before we met? Um, and I, before I met Jordan, I had never even stepped on a sailboat uh, in my life. Um, so I'd never been sailing. Um, and we owned the boat for a good year or two before I went sailing for the first time. My first sailing experience was when I got hired to be a mate on a sailing charter. <laughs> and uh, it was really intimidating. I didn't know how to do any knots or how to raise a sail or anything. Um, so I've been learning through Jordan. Um, when we were living in Key West, there was a community sailing center there where you can rent for, it was super cheap. I think it was like $100 a year. You could take out a boat as often as you wanted to. So we yeah, they had O'Day 22s, which is nice because that's a four and a half sail configuration. So we were able to get her kind of used to it, you know. Yeah. So, but Jordan uh, learned how to sail uh, in college. He was actually he started out by racing and then he became a sailing instructor. So that's our sailing background. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I'm sorry, I was reading some comments, but yeah, I I, I got real into sailing in college. Um, and it's actually funny because when I first got into like the idea of cruising was I remember I took a class and I started to rent this small like 22 I can't even remember what it was 20, probably like an O'Day actually and I'd rent it on the weekends really because I thought that it would impress girls that <laughs> I could say be like this really like innocent thing like hey you want to go out sailing with me um, there you go. All the greatest things in life just come from being a sleaze bag. <laughs> anyway, um, so Ashley Shutter, who was our um, wedding photographer, who actually found us through Project Atticus, um, she, uh, her boyfriend Tyler, also she and her boyfriend Tyler came out to our wedding, and Tyler gave Jordan this really nifty flashlight, and she oh, just commented, Tyler. I love this thing, dude. This thing is awesome. I haven't had the chance to thank you, but this is the the coolest thing. You can recharge it with a USB, and it's waterproof, and it's a flashlight. This thing is so cool. Anyway. So, thank you, Tyler. Thank you, Tyler. Um, but anyway, I was just going to say, I just remember this one guy. I, I, I was renting the boat, and the guy working at the front desk, I said, Hey, is there anywhere that you can rent a boat for, like, multiple nights, you know, and do, like, a trip? I had no idea. And he was like, no, no way, absolutely not. I'm like, really? There's no way you can do this. He said, absolutely not. And from that moment on, I was just like fired up. I'm like, I swear there's a way to do that. And so my very first cruising experience was renting a boat out of Los Angeles and going to Catalina with a bunch of friends. So anyway. So real quick, Rob S. answered the question. He said they were 70 miles offshore uh, Mexican Baja, and they were approached by a 25-foot skiff, which came out of nowhere. Um, they were certain they were pirates and turned out they were fishermen. They tried to wine for fish and that was, and all was well. And we actually had a similar experience when we were in Cuba. And I'm sure the Corsair experienced the exact same thing as what we're about to say. Yeah. So when we were in Cuba, um, we were to- we're so new to cruising. We still are. We- we're not trying to be experts on anything just because we make videos. <laughs> um, but uh, we had a little boat approach us, and they came up to us, and they didn't say anything. And, and we were both kind of like, what's happening? Why is this what's going on? And we're full of these <laughs> stories, you know what I mean, of people. Because in our research, we were looking up, like, what to look out for. And, man, it's so terrifying when you start to look up, like, what the Caribbean safety and security net or whatever and CSSN and all that stuff. You read all of those stories and you just get full of these like terrible images of what's going to happen to you. So what ended up happening was it's illegal in Cuba for the fishermen to sell um, and make money on selling uh, their catch. So what happens is they approach sailboats a lot of the times and cruisers because they want to exchange either fish or shrimp or lobsters Um, for clothing or fresh water or whatever it is but we just didn't know what was happening and they were being a little bit weird and I speak Spanish so I was talking to them um so so it was just like strange for both of us I was probably being awkward making it worse like I always do I'm super awkward um 
but it ended up being fine. And then I mean, totally benign. Yeah, like, yeah, absolutely. And then after that, we just realized when people came close to us, they were just trying to like check us out. And as soon as I started speaking Spanish to them, they're always really friendly. Um, and actually, we got to a point when we were in Cuba where we would look for fishing boats uh, on the horizon, and then we would go and find them in our dinghy, and then ask them. Um, if we can tag along with them or ask them questions or if they can point us in the direction of a reef. And they're always really, really friendly. Yeah. So. And in fact, uh, DV Zyre, that's Dave, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Dave just made a really good point. Um, he said, you really have to be careful that your initial response to an uncertain situation is not an aggressive one because cultural differences can make you jump to the wrong conclusions. I mean, yeah. that is, I agree with that so much, Dave. Like it's, Ooh. Um, there's a lot of people out there that are like, well, what are you going to do if someone approaches you? And they're like, telling me that I should carry guns on board, which I have like a lot of opinions about generally. Um, but mostly it's just too inconvenient from a legal aspect of like carrying guns into different, uh, countries. Um, but like even beyond that, like the amount of times that I imagine we're going to have these situations and they turn out to be friendly people that are trying to interact with us. Like, that's what we're doing this for. Like, we left our country because we wanted to experience other people's cultures. And we're a guest there. And to react, to have your first response be aggressive when you're a guest in someone's country, I think is so wrong. Yeah. Um, and, and sure, you're taking a risk there, but that's... That's what you're doing. You don't, you're a guest. You, no one asked you to go there. You know what I mean? So you need to be as respectful as possible and, and realize that the majority of the time it's going to, people are actually trying to uh, welcome you to their country. So. so Ashley just said, Delos had a dude come up to their boat and steal their dinghy. They took night vision out and chased them down. So that being said, I guess... You know, it's... Well, but petty theft is different, in my opinion. Okay, like, yeah, yeah. When you're... I mean, w if someone's going to try and, like, attack you on the high seas, like, that's that's a different scenario than, like, if you have things of value. And, like, when you're in a lot of these developing countries, like, the stuff you have is of immense value to a lot of these people. And you got to realize, like, that's mm -hmm. a... That's a um, crime of opportunity you know what i mean like if this dude can just get away with that outboard like that's as much as he's gonna make in the next six months or a year you know yeah so that being you said, gotta be smart about it that being said i think one of the like very few advantages of uh cruising in a small sailboat is that we don't really stand out like i don't think people see our boat and think that we have much to steal <laughs> Um, so yeah, we got that eight horsepower Tahatsu that probably looks good. I mean, I think it's just it. You, the goal is you just gotta make sure you're doing everything you can. You know what I mean? Yeah. You gotta you gotta lock up your dinghy and have cables or chains or whatever. Okay, so we'll, and if they still get through all that, then you know they got it. We'll take one more question and then I'll move on to the next topic. Um, so the Harley Hub says, "How's the rigging holding up?" Love those videos. Love those vids. Rigging is holding up great. Yeah, thanks for that question, Harley Hub. No, it's it's. Uh, I'm very happy about how it's all doing. Um, we um, I don't want to do too much of a spoiler alert, but we did have an incident here in Isla Mujeres that we have in an episode coming up in a while, um, and uh, we dragged anchor and did what? what? You weren't supposed to say that. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm trying to not say very Just much. Stop talking. Long story short. We did get a little bit of damage, and mostly it's just, I, I don't want to call it, like, chafing, but, like, we got a lot of, like, mm. scratches and dings on some of our mizzen shrouds, and I'm probably going to, or one mizzen shroud, so I'm probably going to replace that shroud, which, good thing we've got stay lock fittings, because that should be pretty easy. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, um, the Corsair asked earlier, your boat is a catch. Um, this offers a lot of flexibility in sailing configuration. What are your most favorite and least favorite things about your rig? Um, I'll try and be as concise as I can. I, I, if I were to buy a cruising boat, knowing what I know about catches, I'd probably go for a cutter because I really do like sail split sail plans. Like I like having more than two sails. Really, um, I like having more flexibility than a sloop. 
A catch definitely offers you more flexibility than a cutter. So I would say that the catch has the most flexibility out of out of any rig, specifically because you can control the center of effort so so minutely and accurately, which is a huge thing because we um, we use our wind vane um, all the time, our monitor wind vane. That's our main mode of autopilot. So the catch is really friendly with wind vanes as long as you can get the mizzen. Uh, boom to not interfere with the vein itself, which is ironic, but um, generally speaking, you can balance the boat really, really well while under sail. She'll do really well on a reach. Um, the mizzen mast allows us to put up a mizzen staysail when we're on a reach and winds are light, so it's a great way to get a lot of sail area up. I also really like that we have redundant spars, so no single spar takes too much of the load at any given moment. Um, and if one were to go overboard, we'd have another for a jerry rig. That said, I think I'd go with a cutter just because the catch is n the catch is not very good to windward. No boats are that good to windward, but catches are notoriously bad at it. Um, Atticus is good for a catch, and that's because Atticus is designed to be a lean, mean sailing machine, and that's why we have almost no space down below. So. <laughs> If you, I mean, if you're going to have a comfortable cruising boat, um, it's either got to be a pretty darn big boat to be a catch, and even then, I'd probably recommend a cutter anyway. So I'm just going to toot our own horn a little bit, but um, Rob S., he might have left already, he said, I'm going to let you guys go, but I'd like to leave you with the fact that you're the smartest newbie sailor vloggers out there. Stay safe. Um, and I would say Rob. you're probably wrong. We probably just <laughs> sound like we know what we're talking about. You're probably wrong. <laughs> but no, I, that is such a wonderful comment. But I, I would, really and I would say that that's probably mostly due to Jordan because he's obsessed with researching and reading. So I get the easy job. He just word vomits everything he learns um, after he reads a book or an article or a blog post or watches a video about anything under the sun. Um, so he's the the generator of all of the knowledge. But or, yeah, so thank you very much, yeah, Rob. That's thanks. a That's really, really awesome comment, and I, I appreciate that. All right, thank you, Tom Skolan. <laughs> um, so let's see. I wanted to um, talk a little bit about our last episode, which was season two, episode two, and that was our first time um, doing an overnight sail. That was my first time doing an overnight watch. Um, mm, it was our yeah, first top. time really enjoying Atticus as a sailing cruising vessel. So I um, wanted to see if you guys had any questions about the dry tortugas or, you know, the experience of first time doing shakedown cruises. And while we're waiting, why don't you talk about um, what it's like on your first overnight passage, like watch keeping? Because you had a unique experience. That was your very first time doing overnight watch keeping. Yeah, I guess I would say I was, I was like more nervous with the buildup. Like I was asking all of my we'll sailing talk about friends. What you're talking about. They might not have heard me. Um, so Jordan was asking what my first overnight sailing experience was like. Um, and I would say that I was so nervous the week leading up to it that I had, I was trying to learn as much as I could about the call regs and I was like hounding Jordan with trying to like, um, help me figure, figure out what, what I should do in different situations. So we actually went to a national park and I had Jordan. It, it's not, it's a state park. Oh, a state park. In, in Key West, it was, uh, uh, what's it called? Fort Zachary. Fort Zachary Taylor State Park. Anyway, go on. Down. Anyways, I had Jordan uh, simulate boats, um, you know, doing different things uh, at various parts in the, in the state park, I asking would me what I would do in the situation. It was really funny, <laughs> actually. I would have her close her eyes, and then I would, like, draw on a piece of paper the light configuration that she would see, and then I'd start walking in a direction. I'd be like, open your eyes. And she'd open and look, and she'd see, like, you know... I don't know, let's say uh, a white light over a red light and, you know, it's moving from her right to her left. And she'd have to say, okay, that's a motor vessel, you know, crossing my bow or whatever. You and then I'd have I mean? to tell him what I would do in that situation. So yeah. we spent probably like two or three days preparing for my first overnight watch. Um, and I realized it was a lot easier than I thought it would be. And we only saw, I only saw one ship during my whole during my eight hours underway at night so it was not as uh, crazy as I thought it would be 
Um, I actually like can't really remember that experience very well anymore. I just remember we were hand steering. Yeah. On that, we didn't have any autopilot oh, whatsoever. Yeah, that was terrible. So it was actually yeah. horrible. Actually, I do remember um, kind of thinking to myself like, "This is terrible. I'm so nervous. Like, why have we done this?" <laughs> <laughs> and like trying to figure out a way to, um, you know, get out of time to top doing up. it again. <laughs> but cheers, cheers everybody. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I guess I, for me, I'm a nervous person. So my first overnight experience was very, uh, I was very nervous. I was sleep deprived, um, because we were trying really hard to get out of there in time. I was drugged up. Um, so it was, it was kind of like tortuous, but once we got there, that feeling of like dropping anchor and being able to just relax was amazing. Yeah. And I think that that, that first trip you do on a small boat, cause I've been boating for a long time and I had crossed oceans on big motor yachts, um, but I had never done a long distance overnight trip on a sail on a small sailboat. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that was it is kind of crazy how just you're, you're in your, the middle of your watch and then you just kind of look around and you, like I almost had this like moment of panic where I'm just like, OK, like I'm on this cork. This little tiny floating piece of debris practically <laughs> in the middle of this massive ocean. Like it's a feeling that takes getting used to. That and just the dealing with not sleeping can be a so, really hard two thing. Two things. Brost, cheers. Prost. Uh, that's how you say cheers in German. Salud. You've got a look in your eyes. Um, and then somebody, uh, SV Someday, asked how we long were your shifts? Um, and when we started out, we were doing four on, four off. Um, and we've kind of decided that um, during the night we kind of want to do three on three off and yeah. then during the day we'll kind of try to switch back to four on four off um, because for me I don't know why but staying awake is just really hard for me for a complete four hours in the middle what do you of mean darkness. you don't know why I think that's pretty is common it, is it normal I think let us know anybody out there do uh, night passages on their boats let us know if four hours on is tough for you I'd be curious um, can you answer? This one, Jeff. Yeah, Bass, you guys Bassman. have talked a lot about how small Atticus is down below. How big is Atticus, and do you wish she was a little bigger? And that was Jeff Fassbender. Thank you, Jeff. Um, oh, Atticus is 30 feet long, um, and um, I would say I wish that we found a boat that was more optimized for comfort. Um, because the history of the Allied Sea Wind is that it was the first fiberglass constructed hull that was constructed specifically for circumnavigation. So they just piled on as much fiberglass as they could onto one hull and then sent this one guy, Alan Eddy, on an adventure to be like, try to get around the world and see how it works out on our boat. Um, and it worked and, and it was great. Um, but it's just like the, our storage spaces are really random and awkward. And the storage spaces are just tough yeah I mean, there's not a it, lot of storage yeah and it's just it's not ideal and we've been on other boats including um the allied sea wind 2 which was um kind of like the upgrade of the allied sea wind 1 it's 32 feet so 32 feet, only two feet a little bit bigger but also like they but just the volume is way way greater Sorry. but they also just like kind of thought more about the intuitive design of living and so yeah, like hmm someone might want to live on this thing yeah so <laughs> i would say maybe a little bit bigger um and just more importantly is like more optimized for live aboard um cruisers but but that said and i'm sorry if i keep interrupting desiree i i don't want to offend anybody out there she she does a she she handles it well so i'm sorry but um, uh, I, I do think that we are spoiled with just how seaworthy the boat is. Um, I think the hull does so well in a seaway. I mean, just the boat in general, and she handles well. I mean, we tacked up into this harbor the first time that we went for a day sail. And I mean, everyone in the anchorage was just like blown away. Nobody does that around here in East Mujeres. We're sailing up into the harbor all over the marina. I mean, like, the boat handles like it's a day sailor, but it handles, you know, seas like it's a, you know, like it's six or eight feet longer, in my opinion. So, it, uh, although I agree with Desiree, I wish it had more storage space. Um, I don't think our living space needs is, is that bad. Like, the space we have to live is okay. The storage space could be improved. 
But, I mean, that's almost like saying, I wish I could have my cake and eat it, too. Like, yeah. the boat is an incredible sailing vessel. And, you know, so we, we kind of take that for granted. Yeah. For, gra for granted. And, like, yeah, I guess right now we're super happy with, with e the way things have turned out. We just like complaining about our small boat because it's little. <laughs> yeah, you just, it, the, the grass is always greener. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, we, I took her aboard our friend's uh, West Sail 32. Ooh. And, uh, I mean, West Sail's on the interior for oh. a 32-foot boat. It's so incredible. Nice. Or, like, you go aboard a Hans Christian 33, and, like, you feel like you're in a... In like a hotel suite or something with that wraparound dinette and the thwart I, the thwart ship galley. And I literally the, got depressed after yeah. I went onto um, a friend's boat. It was a West Sail 32. We had we were like six months into refitting Atticus, and our friend invited us on his boat, Carl. And I went home and I was just so depressed. I was like, <laughs> I cannot believe we decided on freaking this boat like it's so <laughs> small did you see that table did you see all those places to sleep did you see their galley and so you know i mean it's a little bit of both like we probably should have done more research to figure out what we wanted um no but i mean i would i'm sorry i'm doing it again <laughs> but but the west sail i mean the nickname is is the wet snail i mean it's it does not sail like uh this boat does so i mean i think it's we, I've always put it as there's a triangle, right? And um, there's three elements to, to designing a boat. You've got comfort, seaworthiness, and speed. And the moment you affect one, you affect the other two, period. And the West Sail optimized for interior space and storage and seaworthiness as well. The speed side took the, the suffered, you know, the entire part of that triangle. Yeah, I mean, they made sure comfort and seaworthiness were good, and it just is the slowest darn thing you could imagine. So, uh, and I, I'm sorry if anyone out there is, is owns a a, uh, a West Sail 32. They're great boats, and you can They're find awesome. them in anchorages everywhere around the world because of that reason. So it's a it's a matter of priorities at that point. Or maybe it's just cognitive dissonance. You know, we make decisions and then we try to justify. I'm them. sure there's a part of that, <laughs> but I sincerely think that. Uh, the sea wind is still a really good little vessel. Okay, well we're gonna wrap things up guys. I wanted to take one more question, maybe two. Um, Fernando Brando says, I don't know if I should spend my money with a small sailboat like a 23 footer um, to have more practices or if I should keep saving up to buy a 30 foot boat, 35 foot boat um, with some work to do. Um, what do we think? Do you want to say anything or do you want me to talk? I, just, I didn't actually think, think about it. I was just reading it. You, you right. So, okay, <laughs> Fernando, amigo. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I've been in Mexico too long. Uh, yeah, I've been, I've been hanging out with the guys in the boatyard a lot lately. <laughs> um, but, uh, oh, the Corsair, thank you. Thank you. I Dude, didn't even know how you to, guys are that, awesome. I didn't even know that existed. Yeah. That's awesome. We, thank you. <laughs> we, uh, hopefully we'll get to have a, a real life drink with you here very, very soon <laughs> or in the near future. Thank you. That's so nice. Um, okay. So Fernando, w w that's actually a really great, great question. And I have a very strong, uh, philosophy or, or thought on that. And that is go with the 23 footer. I think that almost everybody that wants to cruise and wants to sail the world would benefit mm -hmm. from owning a small day sailor for a part of their life because what about just joining like a sailing club though like okay so you could just join a sailing club and that's a great way to learn how to sail it's not necessarily a great way to learn how to cruise because cruising is mostly in my opinion about self-reliance um, and owning your own tiny boat, um, tiny, I'm sorry, owning your own day sailor, um, you have to keep up with all the maintenance. So you're going to become proficient at a lot of stuff like fiberglass and engine maintenance and potentially plumbing and, you know, sail repair. Um, Maybe I would say buy a 23 foot day sailor that's in good condition so that you can turn it over and sell it so that you're not losing all of your money because Absolutely. if you want to start cruising i we think it's really important to do your research and find like the perfect sailboat for you 
um, and you, you're going to need a lot of money to do that initially. So, um, yeah, buy the boat, do day sailing, have the autonomy and like the feeling that you own it and, um, uh, take charge of the maintenance, but make sure that it's a good boat so that you can flip it. Yeah. And good boat is, um, I'm not even sure I would say good boat. The, the ability to flip a boat is dependent on how popular the boat is. So if you're going to go with the 23 footer, go with a popular brand. You know what I mean? Go with a popular builder, go with a boat that you, you see being sold and bought very frequently in your area. That way, you probably won't lose a dime on the thing. You could probably make money on it if you were patient enough. Um, and uh, and yeah, and like Desiree was saying, and like we said at the beginning, one of our lessons was like start cruising so you can have a good idea of where you should allocate your time and resources. If you have a day sailor, you're going to learn that just from the day sailor. You're going to learn a lot of stuff like sun protection and how damn important it is you know what i mean we just got a five dollar boost from boost brothers thank boost you brothers. that's awesome you're ma- you guys are don't crazy. don't get too lit okay <laughs> I, Jordan, that's desiree's job okay she's the she's the e-break i'm the enforcer yeah mm. <laughs> um jordan's a little bit sick so I, I think he's probably just gonna pass out in a little bit and sv someday i mean perfect example our start they say their starter boat is a catalina 30 Exactly. I mean, you can buy and sell Catalina 30s all day long. Yeah. And, um, and I would say if you do get that smaller boat first, treat it like, like try to be a liveaboard on it and like try to do some like, not like weekend uh, trips, weekend trips stuff. so that you can like embody what it would be like and what you would want in a 35 foot boat when you are out there. Mm Because I think that's important. Well, guys, I want to wrap things up. It's been about an hour. We've had such a great time chatting with you. Um, Thank you so much for joining us live. Like, it means so much to us. I can't even describe it in words. Um, We have a lot of fun doing this. We look forward to it every week. We hope you guys too. Uh, We hope you guys do too. Too much wine. (laughs) Um, Thank you for all your donations. I didn't even know YouTube does that. So thank you, Corsair and... um, Dave says, visit your friend's West Sail 32 before you buy a boat. <laughs> That's yeah. true, but once you do buy a boat, do not take your girlfriend to go see them. I'll tell you <laughs> that right now. And also, yeah. real quick, guys, if you want to get a text notification uh, of all of our live streams in the future, just text the word Atticus, A-T-T-I-C-U-S, to 43506. Um, and you'll be put on our little list where we'll we'll blast out um, a text to you whenever we have a live stream. And right now we're doing it every week. Um, but once we start sailing and the internet is kind of shabby, we'll probably um, do it'll it. be as often as we can. It'll be as often as we can, and maybe we'll do we'll try to do more than one a week. Um, so this will be a great way for you to guys for you guys to. Um, kind of get in the loop about when we're doing it. So thank you so much. We've had an awesome time. Real quick, I do want to just stress, if you guys had a good time with this live stream, because I sure as heck know that I did, really consider doing this whole text thing. There's absolutely no weird scammy part to it. It's simply you're going to receive a text message every time that we go live. And that is it. And so if you guys have a good time with these live streams, then that's probably a good idea. Uh, for you guys to do. So we'll make sure that we put the instructions on how to do that into the description. And DVZR, could you tell us one more time how to say awesome? It's like grumped bra or mm, something like that. I think you can comment on this video after the fact. So I, Spock, yeah, please let us know. Okay, well anyways, Dave, thank you so much for encouraging uh, everyone who's tuning in today to give us a thumbs up. That does mean a lot to us. Um, also, if you guys are subscribers, if you watch our video in the first like five minutes that we release it, that actually helps us a lot. So, um, yeah, just some tips and thank you so much. Grumps bra. I was Grumps bra. Grumps bra. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. All right. Thanks so much for stopping in and we see will you next week. see you next Monday. Oh, and comment below if you have any ideas for topics of our next week's live stream. Oh, and tell your friends about us. I bet you your friends would really enjoy these live streams. Okay, love you guys. Bye. See ya.